All right. So, I'd like to briefly share something that uh, my wife and I have been talking about. And I find an edifying and interesting discussion that is very much tied to what we read about in Luke chapter 2. A lesson from Mary, and most of all, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For all of us, and I'm specifically thinking about the single brothers and sisters, who, it's interesting, because once you get married, you kind of, your life is somewhat set in some pretty serious ways. Once you make the commitment of marriage, you you just concreted the direction of your life in a very significant way. I mean, God can still call you to different things. He can change your profession, but you're now committed to that man or woman for the rest of your life and whatever children God gives you. And as a man, you're now a provider, period. You know, that it's just, that decision's been made. So as a single person, there are some more options in some ways, more freedom than you have once you have taken the step of marriage. So, My thought, my exhortation for, and this is true for everybody, but specifically as a single person thinking through your life, your life choices, is pretty straightforward, nothing earth shattering. Seek first the kingdom and the will of God. Now we know this, Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We know that as Christians, that's what we're here for, to seek the kingdom of God. But the rubber meets the road when you have to make the choice between things that are good and things that are best. That's where the rubber meets the road. Because we can get away with being mediocre as Christians. That's true for all of us. That doesn't stop once you get married. Now, now it's impossible to be mediocre. No, you can definitely still be mediocre as a married person. But we must not be content with mediocrity, and with fulfilling our minimum duty as Christians. Scripture's full of exhortations. You can look at 2 Timothy 2, 4, no soldier in active service entangles himself in worldly affairs because he wants to please the one that enlisted him. He's focused. He's on a mission. He doesn't have time to dabble in all this other stuff because he's at war. There's a war on. There's urgency. That's 2 Timothy 2, 4. Paul talks about those who are competing in the games. Everyone who competes in the games, they do it and they exercise self-control in all things. They're doing it to receive a perishable wreath, a trophy that will rust, a ring that will collect dust. But nevertheless, they're doing it with discipline and with focus and with tenacity. I, I, can't, I don't eat donuts. I'm trying to win the gold medal. I, I, I can't stay up until midnight. I got to sleep so I can train tomorrow so I can compete in the, the, the tournament next week. They have a focus. They have a drive towards the prize. I, I'm going to win. i got to win. Everything else is brought into subjection to my main goal. I want to win. And therefore, when I go to sit down to eat or when I decide my schedule or when I decide between working out or watching a movie, whatever, I'm doing the thing that's going to get me the gold medal. I'm cutting out everything else so that I win the 100-meter dash. I win the swimming competition. I win the boxing match. That's how an athlete thinks. They've got their eye on the prize. Paul uses that as an example for us as believers. Do we think like spiritual athletes with our eyes on the prize? I want to cut out whatever in my life prevents me from living fully unto Christ, from living with maximum, not minimum fruitfulness, not acceptable fruitfulness, but abundant fruitfulness. That is our calling and invitation as Christians. So a couple of specific examples. I'm going to bring us back to Luke. But let's look at Romans 6, 17, and 18. Romans 6, 17, and 18. Talks about... There are, there are many titles that apply to us as believers. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're children of God. We're also slaves. 
Romans 6, 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We see in Romans chapter 12, present your body a living, holy sacrifice acceptable to God. When we come to Christ, we take up our cross. It's about full devotion, full surrender and submission. And, praise God, it's not just slavery, it's not just servitude, but it is full and complete surrender to Christ. And then he calls us his brothers and sisters. He called, the Father calls us his children. We're joint heirs with Christ. But our hearts should be fully submitted to him, seeking to be faithful slaves of righteousness. Turn to Luke. And the, so the two primary examples I want to look at are, and they don't even deserve to be in the same sentence, because Jesus is the perfect example of everything. So he is example number one. Far distant second, but nevertheless a wonderful example, is Jesus' mother, Mary. Okay, Luke twenty two forty two. Jesus in Gethsemane says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. That kind of has faint echoes of Luke two thirty eight, which was his mother's prayer. After being told that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, she says in Luke two thirty eight. I'm sorry, that reference is wrong somehow. Luke 1.38. She says, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. So both Mary and ultimately Jesus show us an example of submission to the Father at whatever cost to my personal comfort, ease, plans, fun, whatever the case may be. So what I'm arguing for, what I'm trying to present is that there are two different ways you can live and think of the Christian life. One is, I'm a Christian, and I do good Christian stuff, and I have fun, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with kind of coasting in the grace of God. And the other is, I am a Christian on a mission to achieve as much as I can for the glory of God. I'm seeking what he wants for me, what his will for my life is. My, my fun and my joy and my plans are subject to his calling. There, there are two different ways of thinking. One is thinking like someone in a war, and one is thinking like someone who would rather not be in a war. Now, am I arguing for just being stressed out and constantly micro, uh, hyperanalyzing everything you do and Oh boy, is this, is this the best thing I can be doing right now? Am I, am I being faithful? I, no, just relax. God's grace really is enough. We can rest in the grace of God. We can trust him. But we cannot resign to, well, I know it might be better if I did that, but that'd be really difficult. And so I'm just going to enjoy where I'm at as a cop-out instead of following the leading of Christ. So a couple of specific applications to think about. We see this in our priorities. What do I prioritize in my life, in my daily life? Am I seeking the will of God? Am I making time for scripture and for prayer? Are those the things that are most important to me? Or are there, other, are there rivals for Christ in my heart? Am I okay with, yeah, I'm a Christian and I know Jesus, but I'm not seeking Jesus. I'm not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I'm not making time to pray. I'm not making time to get in the word. I'm just coasting. I'm coasting in my spiritual life. That, that's not okay. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do you want to be satisfied? I want to be satisfied. So I want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The Lord says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Well, it's kind of on us if we're not opening our mouth. I'm not, I'm not too interested in what you have to offer, God. I got salvation, and I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm okay with just coasting. That's not what we're called to do. Open our mouths wide. Come to Jesus. Prioritize the word. Prioritize prayer, even over things that are good. They're okay. They're not bad things, but they take us away from our first love. 
And you can see that not only in our relationship with Christ, but with those around us, right? If, if you do that in your marriage, I, I'm married, I'm happily married, but we don't really try to spend time together. I mean, we do sometimes, we talk sometimes. Well, anybody who says that, you immediately think, that, that doesn't sound good for the future of their marriage. Well, it's the same thing in our relationship with Christ, okay? Another, another application would be evangelism. Loving people is messy business. And it's a lot more convenient. It's a lot easier to just be content. I'm loving to the people around me. I'm, I'm investing in the people around me, the people that I'm comfortable with, the people that are fun to be around. That's not what Jesus did, praise God. And if we think it is, if we think we were the people that were fun to be around, then we need to get a good look in the mirror and realize, no, 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 we were not the beautiful ones, and that's why he came to save us. We were the ugly ones, and he's making us beautiful ones. That's the love of Christ, and that's the love we should have for the world around us. That takes sacrifice. That takes recognizing, I would rather do X. I'd rather sit down and watch a movie. I would rather read a good book or work out or fill in the blank, whatever. Think, think good things, not, not, not bad. But do we have the heart of Christ to where I'm willing to sacrifice my comfort, sacrifice my ease, sacrifice my family traditions, whatever the case may be, because I want to love others like Jesus loved me. Okay, so priorities, evangelism. Don't think of evangelism just as passing out gospel tracts. Evangelism is preaching the gospel to a lost world. And there are many, many, many ways to do that. Spread the fragrance of Christ to people. Love your neighbors. Have compassion on the homeless person. Do a heart check. I don't want that homeless guy at my family Thanksgiving because it makes things awkward. Well, is that where my heart's at? Is that where Jesus' heart was at? I'm not condemning family get-togethers. I love family get-togethers, but I hate family get-togethers at the expense of a love for the lost and a passion for the gospel. That's not what Jesus called us to. Okay, another one, vocation. Another application. We want to pursue not just subsistence, not just making it. We want to pursue dominion for the glory of Christ. If God calls you to have a job, what is your job? Whatever whatever that looks like for you as a guy, as a girl, whatever it is. Whether it's a technical job or it's a stay-at-home job or whatever you're doing. Are you pursuing it as a matter of your relationship with Christ? I want to be faithful to Jesus, so my, my, you know what vocation means? It's your calling. So I'm pursuing what God has called me to do with the whole heart, and I'm seeking excellence and progress and dominion and the ability to build the kingdom of God, or I'm making my paycheck so I can pay my bills. See the difference? The big difference in our opportunity to think about what God has called us to do. Even as a wife and mom, stay-at-home mom, I love it. We just recently opened a bank account. And my wife, they asked her what she does, and she said she's a stay-at-home mom. And so the lady behind the counter is training the other teller, the other, the other banker, on how to fill this out. And she said, so just put homemaker. I was just thinking about that. I mean, that's, like, that's the title that they have for the, the form. It's homemaker. That is an awesome title. I mean, have you thought about that? You literally make a home. The foundational building block of society. The thing that most Christmas songs are about that aren't Christmas, you know, hymns. I want to go home for Christmas, right? The home, incredibly central to happy human life, and your job title is homemaker. Well, how cool is that? Pursue it, not with a mind that is content with getting by, but rather with a heart that is seeking abundance for Christ. And then the last application... Is marriage. Single life. Some people, first of all, some people are called to be single. So this is not, I'm not saying everybody should be married or everybody should get married right away or anything like that. Or, you know, you, you have to marry the first person that asks because if you're really a good Christian, then, you know, I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is marriage is something that is to be pursued because of what it does for the kingdom of God. It's not primarily something to be pursued because it makes me feel good. Now, it does. Marriage is full of abundant joys, but it's also full of abundant difficulties. 
Single life is simpler and easier. There's no way to get around that. When I was single, I had so much more free time and so much more ability to do so many other things, for better or for worse. I wouldn't trade that now. I, I would describe my current position in life as drowning in blessings. I definitely feel like I have my hands extremely full, but there's no way I would trade it. No way I would change it. It's beautiful. It's good stuff. But you've got to be real in your assessment of marriage. Marriage is not something to be pursued because once I get married, I will have this hallmarky sunshine and lollipops life. No, no, that's, that's not how it works. But you will have opportunities to build the kingdom of God that you wouldn't have as a single person. And single people will have the opportunities to build the kingdom of God that married people don't have too. It goes both ways. Point is, we were not called to a simple and easy life. So if you're, if you're, if you're, Hang up on marriage is that it's going to make things difficult. Well, welcome to Christianity. Because we weren't called to avoid difficulty. We weren't called to maintain our comfort for as long as possible. So my point is not, everybody, you should go get married as fast as you can. My point is, all of us have to have a heart attitude like Mary showed. Be it done to me, as you have said. Lord, how can I be most fruitful for your kingdom? And if that's marriage, I want marriage. If that's X job, then I want X job. If that's ministering to this homeless guy, then I want to minister to this homeless guy. If that's going back to the the holiday gathering with my family that most of them hate you and it's going to be extremely awkward and I'm going to just love and share the love of Christ, then I want to do that. But my goal is not to seek my comfort. My goal is to seek the glory of Christ. Praise God for that. That's really what we celebrate at Christmas time is that Jesus did not seek to hold on to his comfort, his ease. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself and came in the form of a bondservant and died for you and for me. And that is the love that we're called to spill over onto the world around us. One of my my favorite things this year from our Christmas reading, just closing with this in Luke chapter 2, as just a picture of the love of God for us, that we have the opportunity participate in Luke chapter 2 verse 12 the angel is speaking to the shepherds shepherds the the bottom rung of society these are the gross people they're the stinky people the smelly people the poor people they're not cool they're not on the magazine covers they're not in the movies they're the outcasts of society bottom rung They're, they're garbage men okay The angel says to them, this will be a sign for you. I'm sorry, verse 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. The angel didn't have to say that. The angel could have said today in the city of of David, there's been born a savior who is Christ the Lord. No, he says to those stinky, sweaty, unkempt shepherds. Today in the city of David, there's been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. For you, for me, personally, in spite of all of our nastiness, and if you think you deserve it, then you need to do a heart check before the throne of God and take a deep look at yourself only long enough to see that we need the grace of God. And if looking at yourself doesn't do it, look at the word even better and let God tell you just how much you needed for him to come to save us and then rejoice because today in the city of David has been born for you a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Let's sing praises.